I'm glad to see that we are, we have attracted an audience for this rerun session. And let me just uh, explain briefly for our audience that this session is a, a repeat. It's not original, but it's a repeat of the open session which our committee members presented at the IFLA Congress in Dublin, Ireland in, uh, at the end of July. And we decided that due to circumstances, there were relatively, there were very few members of our committee who could attend the Congress and relatively few people from Asia Oceania. And therefore we decided to rerun the session later. Uh, anyway, at the Congress, we had one hour. So now in the rerun, we are giving ourselves double that amount of time. Whether we need two hours, I don't know, but we'll see. We have that time available. So we have we can do the presentations in a more relaxed fashion and give the people wishing to answer questions enough time to express themselves and to get some answers. So just to introduce us, my name is Winston Roberts. I'm the chair of the Regional Division Committee of IFLA for Asia Oceania, which is an enormous region that stretches from Pakistan around the Asia across to Samoa in the Pacific Ocean. That's a huge region. So obviously we cannot cover every country and every issue and every activity in the region. So we're presenting a selection of good things happening in the region. And the people doing the presentations are for... Um, we're breaking it up into four sub-regional presentations. We're having a presentation from South Asia by uh, two committee members, Dilara Begum and Debal Kaur. Then a presentation from Northeast Asia from two committee members from Japan, Misako Nomura and Rei Iwasaki, who are on your screens. And for Southeast Asia, the presenter is... Uh, not a committee member, but our valued uh, regional office manager in Singapore at the National Library Board. And uh, she attends our committee meetings regularly, and we appreciate her uh, work. And for the final one is the Pacific, and the presenters there will be Jayshree Mamtora, who is on our committee, and... Uh, a person that we have brought in who's an expert on the region who works in New Zealand. He is Tim Kong, who is uh, manager of the uh, digital experience at the National Library of New Zealand, and he'll be talking about the Pacific Virtual Museum. But then we have uh, a selection of people on the IFLA committee. In fact, there are 20 people on the committee. I hope most of them are with us tonight. I haven't checked. Everyone, I'm not checking people, <laughs> but I hope that many of our committee are here uh, so they will be able to jump in and ask questions. And questions, uh, answering questions is in fact one of the major uh, aims of this session. It is to stimulate discussion uh, because I don't want the session to be just the committee talking, members talking to each other. We do that regularly, but I want it to be the committee talking to people out there in the region, and I want people in the region uh, to learn, hopefully, a little bit about what this committee is doing and what the uh, library services in these countries are uh, doing at the moment. So uh, let's go firstly now to South Asia, and the speakers there are firstly... Uh, my colleague, uh, Dilara Begum, who is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Library Studies, uh, Information Studies and Library Management at East West University in Dhaka, Bangladesh. She has a PhD from Punjabi University in Patiala in India. She's an IFLA Fellow, and she has been uh, had a, in the middle of an excellent career in uh, library sciences and uh, professional association activities throughout uh, South Asia. 
And then the second speaker for this uh, presentation is Dibal Carr. Dr. Carr is the vice chair of our regional committee and he's a librarian at Gargotias University in India. Uh, he has also had a distinguished career and with many publications and many awards. And um, I think um, I don't want to explain too many details about his vast list of publications and activities. Um, we don't have time for details. Um, but I just wanted to point out that uh, South Asian presentation includes some references to activities in Nepal, but we, can, as I said before, we cannot cover all countries in all our region in these presentations. So um, we are not actually including um, some of the smaller countries like Bhutan. We're not including Pakistan in this presentation. There are some uh, countries that we did not, we, we don't have members in those countries and we did not have uh, time to bring in um, reports of activities in all the countries in our region. So as I said before, we are limiting the presentations to what was done in the Congress in Dublin and we are repeating that with improvements. So the same uh, comments apply to the other sub-regional uh, presentations. So we will kick off with South Asia, and I'll ask now uh, Dilara and Dibal, or I think it is Dibal who is speaking first. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Right. Dibal, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chan. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak, and thanks to the Regional Divisional Committee. And Sure, sure. Um, thanks, Nifla Regional Divisional Committee, Asia Oceana, for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, on the library cooperation of South Asia libraries. South Asia consists of Nepal, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan, but we will today go for the India, Nepal, and Bangladesh portion. I will talk on India, and Nepal and Bangladesh will talk by Dilara, Dr. Dilara Bebu. <coughs> it is okay, it's moving the slide. Is slide moving? Is second slide is there? No. It's not moving? No. Dibal, are you sharing your own screen? No. Nice working. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, resource sharing among academic and special uh, libraries are very common in India. All libraries are allowed to interlibrary loan and share journals article among them. However, Indian cities have developed different library network within the metropolitan cities. These are because uh, the world has witnessing the knowledge and information exploration during the past few decades. Over 10 million journals articles are published every year besides new items, editorials, and many things in print. Access of information holds the key development, libraries which are storehouses of information and knowledge, and knowledge centers which disseminate the knowledge and information from two important components of present day of society. 
while there is a deluge of information on the on the one hand and cost of collecting processing storing and disseminating of information had been inspiring on the other hand so information buyers power of libraries had been declining year after year because of this resource sharing and cooperation cooperative function through the network had become very important for the library and information centers in worldwide. India is no exception. For that matter, it has more than necessary to network libraries in newly developing countries like India than in the developed nation. Efficient resource sharing can be achieved by using the recent advances in information technology for realizing of a network of libraries, information technology signifies the coming together of the disciplines of electronics, computer, hardware, software, communications, in particular telecommunication, and artificial intelligence and human machine interactions. During the 1980s, library information activities in the country have entered a new era. Individual libraries were coming out of the pro-virtual Berlin Wall around them, and they are trying to form a large community in an effort uh, to tackle the ever-increasing demands for better services quanti quantitatively and qualitatively in an environment already overstrained by financial pressures, forced, motivated, or logic-driven, and the librarians are coming out of their shell to large numbers. This had resulted in change in the information scenario, Indian information professionals, educational specialists, and scientists has realized that time has come to share the information resources and coordinate mechanisms. And this had resulted discrimination change of information scenario in India. Looking from the participation side, it, it has common to find the institution participate more than one network, ultimate goal of information library networks to interlink information resources in metropolitan area. So, so large number of, it is realized large number of metropolitan uh, network has been established. This called in different cities, like in Calcutta, it was Calibnet, in Delhi, it was Delnet, in Bo Bombay, it was uh, Bombnet, it was Pune, it is Punenet, like that many cities have started. Also there is uh, university, wise network, it's called Inflibnet, and there was subject specialist also, and there are some institution specialists also like RNET, CSI RNET, like has been started. These are the some of the networks uh, is in developed in late 80, uh, in early 80s and for resource sharing and library cooperation. Objectives of these networks include promoting and sharing of resources among the libraries by developing uh, a network of libraries, by collecting, storing, and disseminating information, and by offering computerized services to the users. It's undertake a scientific research in an area of information, science, and technology, create new systems in the field, apply the results of the research, and publish them. They are offered technical guidance to the member libraries on collecting, storing, sharing, and disseminating information. It coordinates efforts for suitable collections development and reduce the unnecessary duplication wherever possible and facilitate established of referral and research centers and maintain a central online and union catalog of books, serials, non-books materials, and all the part participating libraries. They are facilitated to promote delivery of documents manually and mechanically and develop 
specialized bibliographic databases of books, serials, and non-books materials. It developed databases of projects, specialists, and institutions, and possesses maintained electronic and mechanical equipment for speedy communications of information, delivery of electronic mail. Delnet uh, is one of, uh, there are many out of that Delnet was coordinated with the other regional and national, even international networks also, libraries exchange of information. So there are many library networks, but today I will just explain only one networks that is very famous in India, it is called Delnet. Delnet later becomes countrywide networks as well as international library network and become very famous because of their good and improved services countrywide and international levels. Delnet, Delhi Library Network, later it was called Development Library Network, was established in 2088 and was registered society and is developed by Ministry of Science and Technology uh, under the National Information Science and Technology uh, Technology and sponsored by them. And it was subsequently supported by National Informatics Center, Department of Information Technology. And now it is self, uh, self maintained. Nobody support it. They maintain, they generate their fund from their service. Delnet membership uh, has been now, it's nearing 7,658 7, member institutions, libraries. Uh, uh, out of that, 7,525 are from India. There are 23 overseas uh, institu institutions are there sharing their information and resources through Delnet. They maintain database of uh, different types of databases like Union Catalog of Books of these member institutions, Union List of Current Periodicals, Union Catalog of Periodicals, Periodicals Article, CD-ROM, and many things. And sharing interlibrary loan document delivery and these databases of databases. Delnet offer interlibrary loan document delivery services, its member libraries. Um, and through email and through by post. And Delnet has also prepared interlibrary guidelines for the member libraries. Delnet have many databases. Um, they subscribe for these institutions and provide service for this institution through these databases. They also provide uh, service retro, uh, um, retro conversion, reference service, professional training, technical support, consortia services, and many more. Mm -hmm. These are some of the consortia. Uh, Consortia service and in India, there are many uh, for development. The many consortia services developed to um, to provide the uh, cooperation between the libraries. Different, like there is a FORSA that is a all all forestry uh, institutions and agricultural institutions are joined there. And there is also IIM libraries, all the management libraries. There are 20 management institutions jointly sharing their resources. There are 62 in, uh, technical institutes. They share their inst uh, in information. That's called INDES. UGC InfoNet, that all two, 223 institutions, they're sharing their info information. This way, all these institutions are sharing their information and resources. Ishot Sindhu, uh, one another is the resource uh, consortium to provide the current as well as the archival access to 10,000 core and peer reviewed journals, databases in different disciplines and different publishers, 22 res uh, resources and four databases under, under this. Also, they provided to the colleges, uh, colleges, 6,000 colleges they have provided provided this uh, 
provided these informations and also they provide ebook shares. Uh, they also share the, uh, among the 217 universities, the resources, and 134 institutions, government funded institutions, and, 30, and 32,000 colleges are sharing this information through this consortium. So this is a huge and the biggest consortium um, in India, and you can say even in the world also because of their number of members. The another thing is Digital India, Government of India launched Digital India program to transform India into a digitally empowered society and knowledge economy. Digital India is a flagship program of the Government of India with division of transform India into a digitally empowered society and knowledge economy. So they have digitized all these things to share the information and how better provide the services. National Digital Library to make available the learners community learning resources through a single window, National Mission of Education through Information and Communication Technology has sponsored the National Digital Library of India project and arranged, funded by Ministry of Education. The National Digital Library is a virtual repository learning of resources, which is not just a repository of search browse facility, but provides a host a service of learner community. It provides user group specific services, such as examination preparatory for schools, college studies and job, university studies and job aspiration for all types of users, they provide services and services for researchers, general learners are also provided. It designed to hold content for any languages available, especially all 10, all 10 most Indian languages are also there. It also provides academic value, including teachers, researchers, librarians, library users, professionals, life learners. And it has about 81 million records, plus 55 institutions are providing the information to these uh, jointly. And so all institutions, especially universities and all other institutions providing information to the digital library. So this is a common platforms for a digital library. Jabal, so may I ask? Informations can be in and Jabal. all institution, more or less all institution in India, university are providing information to the National Digital Library to share their information and library cooperation. Hello, Debal. Debal. He showed um, Ganga, that's the, another initiative uh, to mandate the submission of electronic version of thesis and dissertation by the researchers in universities with the aim to facilitate open access of Indian thesis and dissertation to the academic community to the economic community and there are about Debal, can uh, three million, Debal? more than three million um, theses are theirs and there are synopsis also. There are 570 universities contributing th to these theses and all 754 universities signed for AME for, for providing Debal. the thesis to Debal. this. Excuse me, uh, can you hear me? So anybody can access all these pieces, Indian pieces from anywhere in the world. Debal, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can't, I don't this see any the, sign that you can um, hear me. National Mission of Manuscripts, that's the another, another cooperative share, sharing information from different libraries as as uh, su supported this and contributed all these uh, and digitized all these manuscripts and kept here about 2.3 million data are available and can be shareable and, and sponsored by Ministry of Culture and Tourism. EPG Pakshala. 
is an yeah, another okay. initiatives of you, the Ministry answer. of Education under the National Mission of Education, ICT, being executed by the University Grant Commission. And EPG Parcel is a gateway of all postgraduate courses. It is high quality, curriculum based, and interactive content of different subjects across all disciplines of social sciences, arts, science, fine arts, humanities, natural, and uh, mathematical sciences, linguistics, language, all subjects having e content like more than 22,000 uh, modules and more than 19,000 videos are there, and there are about 30,000 quiz in 77 subjects and 723 papers of postgraduate levels are also there. So it's a huge and uh, about 4,000 uh, authors or teachers or experts from different institutions, universities has developed, contributed these um, online courses. Debal, can you finish your part and hand over to Dilara, please? Otherwise, she will not have enough time. And NPTL, NPTL program is a technology-based learning and has been initiated by the um, Indian Institute of Technology and Indian Institute of Science for providing online courses for engineering, basic sciences, and selected humanities and social science subjects and developed by seven IIT, Indian Institute of Technologies, and more than 2,300 uh, online web video courses have been created, and these contents are used for the teachers, students, and improving the quality education and supplement the classroom teaching. And in India, there are many such digital open access resources and e-learning portals and students, faculty and researchers for using all these portals. The Ministry of Education, Government of India undertake large projects for providing an, an e-content and resources all around the development of students. Some of these are, I already told, shown the NPTL, EPG Parshala, and there are also virtual labs so there are virtual labs. So anybody can through virtual can uh, uh, experiment the labs through these virtual labs, this, which is developed by the again IITs. And there is also a program called Talk to Teachers, Spoken Tutorial, Parshala, and many projects to sharing information, resource courses from school levels to university levels. Um, Thank Dibal, you. you. This is from me? my side. Uh, now, Dilara will talk about Nepal Library Cooperation and Bangladesh Library Cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Debal. Um, I, I would like to share my part, please. Uh, can you please stop your sharing? Okay. Thank you very much, Winston, for, for inviting me in this very special event. I think it's a very good thing, uh, you know, the globally we can reach more people because it's difficult for us to meet in, in person. So I would like to start with the Nepal Library Cooperation. So, uh, and, and I'll go for the Bangladesh uh, uh, later on. Do you hear me clearly? Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, the Nepal Library uh, basically cooperations, uh, actually I, I have got some of the information from my Nepal uh, colleague and uh, I try to put some of the information over there. Maybe they are doing more, but uh, I will try to leave my level base to input to this Nepal Library cooperation. So Nepal Library cooperations, basically I, I wanted to say they have a Consortium, the Nepal Library and Information Consortium, which basically it was established by a group of institutions. And the idea is that, like how they can, you know, give more access to the electronic resources, uh, especially the Nepali Educational Institute. So it's within the ne Nepal. Uh, they, they have another project that is called Nepal Bharat Library. It's a cooperation between uh, India and Nepal. They are doing a lot of works under this project. Uh, they also run one project that is uh, basically five years UNESCO Danida project. And uh, through that project, they have 
actually do some of the major changes and overall development of the National uh, uh, Library of uh, Nepal. The following uh, uh, some of the achievement they uh, you know they did it from their project. So the, they actually published the Nepal National Union catalog. This is very unique achievement for this project. The modern they buy some modern equipment to run this sector very, very efficiently. And uh, they also, you know, uh, they develop the human resource because without uh, developing human resource, you cannot do anything more. And uh, they also promote and promoting the publication of children's uh, literature. Uh, they also got, uh, you know, grants from the Japanese, uh, Japan, they call it Japanese culture grants aid. Through from this aid, basically, um, they actually received some of the micrographic equipment uh, from Japan, like microfilm cameras, micro, uh, uh, microfilm uh, reader, book binding machine. So this is very important for the library, and, and this is very important for you know, preservation and conservation of the library materials. So under this aid, they got it. Assistant from JICA and Apple, they also got the, some of the assistant from JICA, and uh, basically, uh, through that project, they actually, uh, you know, develop new, develop their children's sections and try to promote their activities. And they also provide the books on Nepal and other reports in both Nepali and the English language. They also member of uh, international, they have taken some of the membership, international membership is like a, a CDNL, uh, then CDNLO and UNESCO uh, Association for Library, UNAL. So they are the membership of that international uh, the membership they have taken. Now I'm going to the library cooperation in Bangladesh uh, as uh, I'm in by based in Bangladesh. Uh, so, and I'm actively involved with this sector. So I try to give you more information regarding uh, the challenges and cooperation in, uh, in Bangladesh. So the present scenario, you can say in, in Bangladesh, actually the, the government, we have a vision to build a digital Bangladesh. And, uh, and through this vision, I think as an LIS professional, we can do a lot of things to help our government to make the Bangladesh digital. And, and we are the, because we are the information professionals, uh, if you wanted to make the Bangladesh digital, so library can, or library professionals can, uh, can play, play a vital role. They have a very special wing they have developed that is called API, um, access to information. And now they are called innovation to uh, information. So uh, through that, uh, this is under the prime minister office and through this uh, you know, office, they are doing a lot of activities. Like they have made the whole, uh, uh, you know, the office environment like an e-portal. So you can find a lot of government information from the e-portals. So this is a very unique, uh, you know, the initiative taken by the Bangladesh government. They also uh, have an e-book project. Through that uh, project, they have, you know, created e-books in uh, especially for the primary school st students and they can get that e-books from their own home uh, rather than that basically we have a true consortium in bangladesh because you know consortium means it's very helpful for allies professionals because we can get the resources in a reduced price so this is very important so we have a two consortium one is enough 20 consortium now it's called leap Corp. and through that a library cooperation of bangladesh now it's called leap Corp. Through that, uh, you know, uh, this, you know, the consortium, we are getting many resources and we are sharing that resources in a very, you know, uh, reduced price. And we have another project that is run by the University Grand Commission of Bangladesh that is called the UGC Digital Library. And it was established in 2012 only and it's funded by the World Bank, uh, you know, and, and Higher Education Quality Enhancement Project. Through that project, actually, now and it's at a more almost uh, 95 members uh, university and and the uh, uh, private and public university are enrolled them over there and we are paying some of the portion and some of the portion is paid by the ugc so these are the very good initiative and and we are basically very rich in terms of uh, e-resources because to because of these two consortium uh, basically in Bangladesh, actually, we are using open source software because if open source software itself is a blessing for us, we think, because we don't need to pay and, uh, and the source course is open for us. So we can, uh, you know, we can, you know, easily uh, customize according to our needs. And some of the information professionals, they also work very hard to introduce this open source software in unit because I also work very hard and I introduce all the open source software which is related to allies professionals in, in my university. 
Uh, basically, uh, we're using Koha for integrated library management system, Greenstone for digital library, and DSpace for institution repository. There are three of uh, three softwares actually we have installed in my you know university, and we're using this Koha um, from 2011. And we also gain some software and their space. Other than that, that, that uh, some of the library they are using flames also. Uh, in 2005, basically, uh, ICT Digital B library they introduced this D space for first time in Bangladesh. And later on, actually, other private universities they have taken initiative. Uh, you can say their own initiative to to introduce this open source software like East Coast University, Islamic University of Technology, um, uh, Bangladesh Agriculture University, Black University, Great Life, Central Library. So many many universities library they are using this open source software nowadays. Uh, you can see the, the I can say the beautiful picture of the East Coast University Library. It's the model of e library in Bangladesh before we started work with open source software a long time back in 2010. From 2010 still today, we are actually developing our, you know, uh, the the library in terms of, you know, technology and other resources. And we have a very good relationship with Delnet SA. Uh, so this is a different one, not uh, not in, in India based. This is a digital library network in South Asia. Uh, I work as a the general secretary of this network. This network is basically helping the South Asia region to develop their, you know. Uh, the, the digital library in their own country. Uh, basically, it was established in Nepal, Kathmandu, and later on, actually, now the secretary office in Dhaka, East Coast University, and uh, and we are uh, actually arrange and organize several trainings on digital library in uh, basically in col collaboration with the Delnet SA. So you can see one of the seminar pictures with the EW Library, East Coast University Library, and Delnet SA, and one of the some of the members from India, Bhutan, they join, and in and then Pakistan also, Bhutan uh, in Nepal also. That they are standing over there in the picture, and the government mm -hmm. people who invited government high officials. Uh, she, 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 he is sitting, uh, you know, you know, uh, beside me, and he is ex 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 actually the policy maker. So he, uh, we try to, you know, give them the impression what we are doing in our sector because in future they will help us to build this kind of activities in our country. Uh, this is one of the another regional workshop we organize in Nepal. That is in uh, Nepal Open University, Sri Lanka. It was in uh, 2014 only. It was very heavily, you know, appreciated by the uh, Vice Chancellor of uh, Open University of Sri Lanka. This is jointly organized by Open University of Sri Lanka and East Coast University and Delnet SA. It is in regional workshop in Bhutan. We went over there. And we train them, especially the, uh, the Koha software, and 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 we have a very very strong team. They are actually technically very sound, and this is basically professional skills development and partnership. You know, in Bangladesh, I have uh, East Coast University have organized this event for for LS professionals in Bangladesh. Uh, it's a very uh, actually, in this, uh, you know, we generate the innovative ideas to achieve the global vision of IFLA 2018. And the representative from the, uh, the LS professionals in Bangladesh, they join over there, and we prepared a note. Um, in that note, we can easily identify the present condition of future and the future condition and future scenario of the LS professionals in Bangladesh. And we send a report to the IFLA. So this is, this is called our, our vision, our future. Uh, we also started the interlibrary loan, loan forum. Recently, we have uh, developed, as I think it's not more than two years, and uh, around uh, 10 to 11 uh, library are working. We are working together. This is a pilot project. If it's successfully run, then we may include more members in Bangladesh. So interlibrary loan forum in Bangladesh. Uh, actually, in Bangladesh, we have two associations. One is Library Association of Bangladesh, and another, the, another one is BALID. That means Bangladesh Association of Librarians, Informative Scientists, and Documentalists. So this association, both, both associations, they are trying the level base uh, to develop this uh, sector in our country. Uh, basically, Library Association that was established in 1956. I have experienced uh, work as the acting president in Library Association in 2010 and 11. So I have actively involved with associations. And they are trying their level best to develop our, uh, you know, sectors. And and the ballot it was established later on. It's in 1986. After that, um, uh, you know, uh, they are trying their level best to develop the different, different, uh, you know, the training for 
to development of our allies educations and allies professionals in Bangladesh. They also established in integrated national information systems in Bangladesh. Um, basically, I want to say, if you wanted to work in collaboration means your commitment, if you're fully com committed, so you can achieve more things. So this is very important. Uh, cooperation means commitment. So through the commitment, you can lot, do a lot of things. So, and, uh, and, and you know, cooperation uh, is very important if you do it, you know, in every country, so we'll be rich. So whatever I, I can say, I can do anything, you cannot. You can do things I cannot. Together, we can do great things. So it's the quote, quotation I have taken from Mother Teresa. I believe on this. So if we do like, if we do work like this, then we can lead our professions. We can help each other. So uh, that this is the end of my presentation. I'll be happy if you have any questions, you can uh, and ask me, I'll be happy to answer uh, questions. Thank you, Winston. Thank you, uh, Isha Oshinia, to invite me over here. Thank you very much, Dilara. That was very inspiring. Um, I don't want to take questions right now. I want to, because we are running behind and I'd like to pass the microphone straight over to our uh, Japanese colleagues. Misako and Ray, uh, for their presentation. I just wanted to introduce them very briefly. Uh, Misako Namura is a board member of the Assistive Technology Development Organization and secretary of the Japanese DAISY Consortium. So she is a strong advocate for inclusion and has been promoting accessible library services for people with special needs for many years now. And Ray Iwasaki is a professor at Kyoto Notre Dame University. And her main research professional topics are school library services for children's reading and learning. And she's a, a member of the board of directors of Kyoto Lifelong Learning Foundation. Okay, dear colleagues, it's over to you. Ray and Misako. Yes. Hello, this is, this is Rei Iwasaki. Uh, our presentation is Sustainable Library Cooperation in Northeast East Asia and Beyond Japanese Perspective uh, by Rei Iwasaki and Misako Nomura. Today, after introducing activities among national libraries, we will present two case studies on the sharing mat of materials and technology to develop cooperation among libraries. I would like to talk about some examples of exchanges, mainly among Japan, China, and Korea. Although the theme is library cooperation in Northeast Asia, please note that since the presentation will be made by participants from Japan, the main focus will be from Japanese perspective. Currently, the National Diet Library in Japan has exchanges with the National Library of China and the National Library of Korea and the National Assembly Library of Korea. The National Diet Library of Japan and the National Library of China have been sending staff to one another since 1981, thus deepening friendly relations and improving each other's library services. They have reported on their activities. Libraries' core functions, such as an acquisition and cataloging of materials, reader services, and reference services, library administration and management, services for parliament, digitalization of materials, and establishment of library networks. The shared concern at the moment is how they should respond to the digital age. 
The National Direct Library of Japan and the National Library of Korea have been implementing exchange activities since 1997, sending staff to each other. The two institutions recognized the need to the need to deepen mutual understanding and collaborate on solving common problems, considering that they are national libraries of neighboring countries in East Asia that have been influenced by Chinese culture and use Chinese characters. Hmm. Mutual visit programs between the National Diet Library and the National Assembly Library of Korea started in 2003 as institutions that provide in the, and as institutions that provide library and research services to the parliament the two libraries held meetings to share experiences and activity actively exchange opinions questions and answers the exchange between the library of congress is an interesting initiative uh, this is the first case study. IBBY's branches, CBBY, KBBY, and JBBY consulted in 2019 and decided to introduce each other to outstanding children's books since 2000. We want all children to know the cultures of various countries around the world and especially want children to understand each other and become friends with children from neighboring countries. We believe that understanding each other with of peace, and we are trying to reach one of the goals of the SDGs. Yeah. The theme for 2020 was environment. The theme of the theme for 2021 was family. The theme for 2022 is friendship. Click on, on the cover of each book and you'll find the introduction in two or three languages. In this way, we can share information about children's books across language barriers. Uh, greeting from Japan. Uh, my name is Misako Nomura. I would like to talk about Merge Media Daisy technology. Disability inclusive library community, including my organization, has been focusing on those who are left to behind before and after the adoption of SDGs, such as people with disability and linguistic minority people. So now let me introduce you, Daisy Technology as a strategy to make libraries stronger to ensure information accessibility for those target people. Disability originally started out as an international standard for digital talking books for persons with visual impairment. It is developed and maintained by Daisy Consortium established by IFLA LPD section members in 1996. Later, it became multimedia standard that can meet the needs of wide range of people with reading disability. The integration of DAISY into accessible EPUB format has opened the way for further development, ensure access to reading materials not only for users and the library, but also for the publishing world. Next page, please. Let me explain the characteristic of DAISY uh, with this screenshot. Text and audio and images are synchronized. And the navigation is available. And you can listen to uh, the, the text being hard, it's highlighted 
with yellow color. So you can easily understand where to read. The ruby of four Chinese characters is added if necessary. Different playbacks, playback styles are available by changing the display settings, font size, color contrast, and reading speed. So using this tool, children with print disabilities, they feel they can read and understand easily and confidently. Next page, please. So um, using uh, techn DAISY technology, multimedia DAISY EPUB textbooks for elementary and junior high school students with print disabilities are produced and provided under the amended copyright law and so-called barrier-free act in 2008. And the Sapir Library and National Diet Library Services for Persons with Print Disability have also standard, started providing daisy EPUB books online. So copyright is a very important issue, it's very important. Next page, please. So uh, th this is a website for everyone, multilingual picture books in daisy <laughs> format by multilingual picture books club. It is website for everyone. You can access uh, if you wish. And then uh, this website invites non-Japanese people living in Japan to enjoy daisy picture books in their native language, such as English, Spanish, Korean, Chinese, Indonesia, Indonesian, Filipino, and other different language. You can enjoy it. Next page, please. And uh, the promotion of DAISY is supported by Japan Library Association, Library Services for Persons with Disabilities Committee. Actually, I'm a member of the committee and the, the section held the training about the inclusive library services, including promotion DAISY and provided its video with sign language and captions. Next page, three. So we, we, we have, we are promoting EPUB accessibility now toward the bone accessible publication for everyone. However, EPUB standard does not include language specific parts, which is different from Roman alphabet countries, such as Japanese, Korea, and Chinese. So we need to work together with the stakeholders for its internationalization to solve such problems. Next, please. In conclusion, collaboration and interaction among library is important for library development. The foundation for this is the development of diverse materials, human services, and technology. In order to realize this, the relationship between the library community and other fields is also important. In addition, next please. And, and the, uh, we introduced two cases, case studies, which is closely related to quality of education and peace, justice, strong institutions among the sustainable development goals. As we mentioned already, libraries can achieve more of, more of the sustainable goals through collaboration and the development of various technologies and resources. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Misako and Ray. 
and I'm very glad you finished by a reference to the Sustainable Development Goals, because this is one of the most important activities of IFLA, to encourage its members to work towards those goals in their own countries. Um, now, we have come to nearly eight o'clock in my time, uh, so we need to go straight to Southeast Asian Libraries with a presentation from Lin Lee Shaw. And I uh, just wanted to remind you that Lin Lee is the regional office manager for IFLA in, in this region, based in the National Library of Singapore. She's the director of their partnership division. She's actively involved in many uh, in the local and international library scene. She's the vice president of the Library Association of Singapore. And uh, she's, well, she's very active. Thank you, Lin Lee, and over to you. Thank you, Winston. Okay, um, before I start, I'll just give a short background of how the cooperation in Southeast Asia libraries have been happening. Um, for almost uh, 55 years, I think in 1967, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations have come together, and we call this ASEAN. So I think Liberians being Liberians, we are very trendy, and we always respond to trend very fast. So in 1970, which is about 50 years ago, we actually kind of formed the CONSAL, which is a Congress of Southeast Asian Liberians, where Liberians of these um, 10 countries meet annually to discuss about things and promote exchanges. And we also have conferences held every three years. So at this uh, moment, I would also like to make use of this opportunity to urge everyone to sign up for our 18th um, CONSAL conference that's happening online on the 29th and 30th November. So do look out for our publicity. Okay, yes. so for- Yes, good. <laughs> Thank you. So for Southeast Asia, we actually have 10 countries. So basically we are from Brunei, um, uh, Cambodia, and we have also Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. So there are 10 of us. So basically during COVID, um, we kind of look at what things have happened. Um, the discussion was very, very true and uh, real because it's happening the same across internationally. All of us actually experienced a temporary closure of our libraries and a lot of our services have been disrupted. But now it's good because we have already recovered some of the on-site visitorship. So you can see here some of the figures that's here happening, like for example, in Singapore, Brunei, Indonesia, we all see an increase in online usages, online users, as well as overall loans. And for Malaysia, it's the most amazing. They actually have about 210% increase in borrowing of digital materials. And for Myanmar, the recovery in on-site visitorship is also very good. It has about 30% increase already. So with all these exchanges, we thought we should actually engage more in terms of finding out from how other world, part of the world is happening. So in 2020, the IFLA Regional Office for Asia and Oceania, we, as well as NLB from Singapore, we decided to call, come up with this digital platform called Leaders Conversations. It's a platform whereby we invite top leaders around the world, as well as Southeast Asia, to come together to share insights and views on what are their think and thinking and thoughts about the new library world. So the 2020 edition, because it's also happening in, during the COVID world, our focus was on libraries in the post-COVID-19. And this was an enclosed invited session and it was really well received. So we thought maybe in 2021, we kind of opened it to more people to attend. So there were 32 top libraries that can come aboard and 13 countries came on. And we have a very, very welcoming uh, attendees, about 400 over people. So you can see some of the screenshots and we kind of look at what are the future, visioning our future and what are the master plans for our libraries and archives in the upcoming uh, world and era. So there are some highlights that we are going to show you uh, passed from these uh, leaders conversations. For example, in Philippines, the Library Association of Philippines, I think our Vera side would know, they have actually come through this Giving Hope Through Reading project, which is very interesting where they bring reading materials to hospital to help with the COVID patients while they recover from body in terms of medicine. The books actually also help them mentally to recuperate from this illness itself. And for Indonesia, 
the National Library of Indonesia actually worked with banks as well as you know, telco companies to offer free internet access. This kind of give people the importance and the visualization to see how a very important role library play. And therefore the village library has actually received more fundings. So this is actually a very good development. And as for Malaysia, I think the Librarians Association of Malaysia, I think Azan would have shared that they actually built this little book houses like Book for Life project where actually people can exchange books uh, during the COVID time and you, you know they can only come out at a certain time. And so therefore this encouraged community to exchange reading materials during the situation. So for Singapore, we use this chance to rethink our plan. We actually launched the Libraries and Archives Blueprint 2025 whereby we kind of invite the communities and partners to join the libraries and, the, uh, and archives to see how we can actually reimagine the libraries and archives. And at the same time, our National Library also worked with the National Museum to document COVID-19. So we welcome uh, public to give us websites, photographs, and even ephemeral to capture what the impact of COVID-19 has done to us in our daily life. So because of the success of the Leaders Conversation, I think the IFLA Regional Division Committee also decided to work on this webinar. We, this is very, very good uh, success because we have about 600 over registrants. I think it's the first time we have so many people who join us. And we are very heartened to also see a lot of institutions gathering a lot of their staff and colleagues coming together to listen to this webinar, where I think Winston was the one who chaired the session and we actually talk about the United Nations on Sustainability Development Goals. So this webinar actually inspired a lot of us because we have very interesting projects that were brought up. One of them was Vietnam, where they shared about the mobile multimedia library van. So this was the one that provided mobile services to students as well as soldiers. And the other one is Indonesia again, because they really had something very interesting. They work with um, organizations to do training because you know, during COVID situation, a lot of people lost their jobs. So they kind of uh, work with the libraries around the village itself to train adults, you know, for example, like how to take care of cops or even like housewife to make new learning and if uh, their livings, like for example, how to do bate. So this is something that they can actually kind of learn new skills and actually go into businesses or start their own startups and things like that. And at the same time, you didn't forget about the traditional things that they, and heritage that you want to pass on to the children. They also train children like traditional dance for practices and things like that. So you can see it's a picture where children are enjoying themselves. And of course, Philippines, they, besides working with the hospitals, they also work with communities to give away books. And besides that, I, for Singapore, we work with all the various ministries to reach out like people uh, under, from the underprivileged group itself. And we also work with um, um, how to reach the um, students. And key thing, we also noted that there's a lot of in, um, fake news going through. So we try to um, work on this um, digital information and how to combat fake news itself. And this is something that we work with um, the ministries of defense and ministry of communications. Um, for to see how we can actually provide information literacy. And um, last of uh, not all least, but we also look into how to develop uh, skill sets for our librarians, because just now we mentioned about how we help the community. This is something that the um, National Library of Philippines also did, where they did a seven uh, online conference where we gather all the ASEAN members together. The, this library for service framework, they kind of produce on how to document library services in the region during the pandemic. And it kind of cover four key areas, which is like on operations, services, customer engagement, as well as talking about people and culture. And lastly, for Vietnam, they also work with the National Library of France to launch this French Vietnamese Porter in early 2021. So you can see, besides the community, the people, Within the region, we also go international to work um, with different countries and libraries and archives to see how we can promote cooperation and exchanges during this period. So with that, I end my presentation. Vincent, over back to you. Thank you, Billy. That was fantastic. You managed to cover a lot of ground in very few minutes. It's a shame that you haven't got more of the same. Maybe we should do it again. <laughs> that was <laughs> That was fascinating, really. Um, I particularly liked your 
Uh, the emphasis in, in the presentation on the communities, community libraries and people doing running community activities in libraries. Uh, and also, uh, you know, your presentation around the whole gamut from the communities up to more academic things such as historical materials in Vietnamese libraries. Uh, it's a wide range of, of uh, themes and topics that we could spend all day discussing, really. Yes. Um, and it's very good to hear about the leaders' conversations. That's right. Good to be reminded. Okay, now I would like to pass straight on to the Pacific segment of our presentation. And first of all, I'd just like uh, Jay Shri to kick off because we, um, we don't, I don't think from looking at the list of participants, we have other committee members from the Pacific in our webinar this time. So uh, I think probably Jay Shri and me are the only ones. Excuse me if I'm wrong, but I can't see others. So Jay Shree, you are the Pacific here, introducing Tim later. So just say, tell, tell the audience uh, who aren't familiar with us um, a little bit about your experiences in the Pacific and then pass over to Tim. Over to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Excellent, okay. Um, so um, thank you, um, Winston. Um, I have to say the, the Pacific Islands are very uh, dear to my heart. Um, having lived there for um, more than 17 years um, in the Solomon Islands and in Fiji, working in different types of libraries. Um, I currently live in Australia. I have been uh, working in academic libraries in Australia for a little while now. Um, and I have to say that as dear as the Pacific Islands and their libraries are to me, um, this project um, is uh, of particular interest to me um, based on that experience. Um, uh, Tim Kong, whom you've just introduced, um, is um, the manager of the Pacific um, Virtual Museum Project, um, which is being funded by uh, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And it's being implemented by the National Library of New Zealand, where Tim works uh, in collaboration with the National Library of Australia. So a collaborative project there. And initially it was funded for the period uh, 2019 um, up to February, 2022. Um, uh, luckily further funding was obtained from uh, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, taking the project right up to June, 2023. Uh, now, the aim of the secondary funding was to build on the work of the pilot phase, that initial 2019 to 2022 period, um, but as well to enable uh, travel and engagement in the Pacific region that couldn't be undertaken earlier during the pandemic. So this project aims to empower people in the Pacific Islands uh, as well as anyone from the Pacific um, living elsewhere, like, like myself, I, you know, it's very dear to my heart, and enabling them to see and discover and explore items of digitized cultural heritage that are held in collections all over the world. So items about the Pacific that could be in the Pacific or elsewhere. Uh, and it's quite possible that um, some people in the Pacific aren't even aware of all of these items. Um, and um, uh, um, the project uh, will help the, to support them uh, to increase their knowledge and connect them with aspects of their own culture and history. So I don't want to go too uh, much more into the details of this project. Um, I will hand over to Tim to uh, demonstrate the website that he has created and to tell us more about this fascinating project. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jess. Thank you very much, Jessri. Tena koto katoa, ko nabukalevu te maunga, ko drika nekelo te awa, ko nati fiti te iwi, ko te moti toko ingoa. Uh, no reira, tena koto, tena koto, tena tato katoa. Uh, kia ora koto, nisambulu vinaka, talofalava, konnichiwa, salam alaikum. 
uh, to all of you out there. I appreciate there's a, probably a wide range of other greetings I could give, given the, the scale of our participants here. Um, I am coming to you live um, from Whanganui Atara, uh, Wellington, Aotearoa. Uh, I should say up front, and I'll just, apologies, I'll just share my screen. Uh, I should say up front that I am not a, uh, an archivist, uh, nor am I a librarian. Uh, and nor am I trained in the world of museums or galleries. So um, I might be somewhat of an outlier to uh, lead a project that, as Jesri has said, is uh, called the Pacific Virtual Museum uh, and is implemented by the National Library of New Zealand in collaboration with the National Library of Australia, uh, particularly when that project is funded by the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, in as Jeshua said, in, in its simplest form, it's a project which aims to make visible and accessible the digitised cultural heritage of the people in and of uh, the Pacific. I am of the Pacific. Uh, that's an ocean uh, that covers 33% of the surface area of this planet. I am, like many Pacific Islanders, not born in the islands, islands of their parents, nor am I fluent in the language of my father, nor am I fully aware of the nuance of the many customs of his islands in particular. Uh, in, also in the ways of the Pacific, uh, my grandfather on my father's side was Chinese and my mother is Pakeha of Aotearoa. And so by definition, I'm not indigenous Fijian. Um, and additionally, like many Pacific Islanders, uh, I've lived the vast majority of my life far from Fiji. And this lived complexity is ever present uh, for me, but also I know for many other Pacific Islanders, uh, as I seek to understand my father's culture uh, and to walk my own path here in Aotearoa. I'm like all Pacific Islanders, a child of capitalism and colonialism. And by that, I mean, I have benefited from these forces whilst also often being simultaneously really ignorant to the impact of those forces on the islands of the Pacific. Um, and like a child, as a result of this project, I continue to learn of this legacy uh, in relation to culture and heritage and how we define it, how we've um, recorded it, how we've told it, talked about it and how we share it today. Um, so I present to you today as that person, uh, and my talk today is just to reflect on some of the some of the key things uh, of leading this project. Um, and before I go on, I should just say, um, as uh, per the URL there, digitalpacific.org, uh, please feel free to just explore the site in another window uh, on your screen uh, if if you wish. Um, I'd like to start with a story about why this project matters and why what you do in libraries and archives matters. Um, this still frame on the screen here uh, is from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, specifically, uh, it's uh, their international development team who, in support of our project, collated and digitised about 100 records, and they've increased it now, uh, from their archives and called it the ABC P Pacific Collection. Uh, it's from a short video uh, on the link there titled um, Suva of Yesteryear, and this still frame is at about the four minutes, 30 second mark. Uh, when that collection was launched and this video was part of the promo reel, I saw this video and was just watching it. And I forwarded it to my father with a WhatsApp message and said, hey dad, check this out. 1960s, Suva, you were there. Um, and my dad watched this video and then he sent me a message on Facebook saying, Tim, do you know that's the Kandavu Levu, that ship in the, in the middle of the frame there? Uh, and that's a, it was a really powerful moment when I realized that it was the Kandavu Levu because this ship sank in 1964. And it is still, I think, the worst sea tragedy in recorded Fijian history. The ship was owned by my dad's two brothers, my uncles, who both died in the sinking. And so I've never met them, obviously. And as my dad tells the story, he'd wanted to sail on that ship that day, uh, but he was too scared of asking his older brother permission. So he jumped off the boat. Uh, and in our, fa in our family, I think we're very aware of the sliding doors moment aspect of that moment, that he jumped off the boat. Um, and this footage uh, has sat in the vaults at ABC for over 50 years and has only been digitized to support the project that I've led. To have my father see this footage, which he had no idea existed, of this vessel, which obviously meant a lot to him and is, is a real familiar connection, fam family connection, for just the few fleeting seconds it exists, it's about two or three seconds, uh, and he, to see it via a Facebook post, and then to have him share it back with me, uh, that's why what we do in Librarians and Archives Matters. Um, this project, as I said, uh, is a very small team, uh, and it is based of Tapatakuraraya of the Cook Islands and Ulu Afayesi of Samoa and myself. Our aim at the start of this project was to, in a very uh, deliberate Pacific way, uh, make connections matter, but more importantly, make relationships matter. And we wanted to include the voices of the Pacific in the design uh, and the development of this website. 
We started, uh, Tapatu and myself, in January of 2020. And at that point, as we did our initial planning, we were hoping to travel uh, into the Pacific to build relationships and understand what this project could and should enable for them. Uh, but as you might have heard, uh, we had a global pandemic and that slowed down a lot of things. Uh, so we had to do change pretty much everything uh, within two or three days. And we moved to doing everything uh, online. Uh, we moved to engage as much as possible uh, with a range of different tools, online tools, um, asynchronous, obviously, given the eight or nine time zones involved, um, and all a number of and all of our developers as well. Uh, we only met once face to face before our first lockdown here in Aotearoa of March 2020. Um, so this screenshot here, which you can see, uh, was our default operating mechanism, <laughs> which as I imagine it probably was for, for many of you as well. Um, the aim of this process was to deliver our website and the project, but most importantly, that all of these connections were to engage in a way that honoured Pacific relationships, uh, realities and timescales. We've continued all of our public engagement and promotion this way, using webinars highlighting collections and hosting knowledge holders from institutions such as the National Library of Australia, the Tuvalu National Library and Archive, the Pacific Community Library, as well as community elders uh, from uh, places like Nui and Rotuma. Our site has been constantly uh, and deliberately informed by this co-design group, and their feedback has been directly reflected in, in the design and functionality as we've built it. Um, as uh, a result, and obviously the changing conditions of border controls, we're really looking forward to engaging in person with existing and potential colleagues. Uh, Tapatakura spent the last uh, week in, in the Cook Islands, uh, connecting with University of South Pacific and libraries there in, in the Cook Islands. Uh, and on Sunday, I fly to the Solomon Islands uh, to meet with um, colleagues there in Honiara, which will be very exciting. Um, so yeah, our first reflection there was that connections matter. Uh, but relationships matter more and you have to look after them as you as you build and connect. Um, my second reflection was we needed to build digital, but we also needed to build for the Pacific. Um, we knew we were designing for people in the Pacific, and so we couldn't, by definition, design with European or uh, US or networks defaults or potentially even uh, Asian or Southeast Asian defaults. Uh, we had to design with digital constraints as our starting point. So we focused on two things, building for low bandwidth and high cost mobile networks. And what that means is we want the site to uh, function well on 2G and 3G environments, and also places where data is expensive as on in the slide here. Um, we do this really deliberately in terms of our coding and development. No, we aim to have no single page on the site more than 800 kilobytes in size. We, we intentionally focus on not embedding content, not adding uh, lots of visuals, keeping it very light. Uh, the second thing is we focus on being mobile first and designing for uh, the, uh, the default device, which is increasingly uh, for people, uh, young people and old people across the Pacific. Uh, and the people that we want to reach are on a cell phone. And so we have to design for cell phones. Uh, this means we don't really deliberately don't design for desktop browsers in mind. Um, there was a moment uh, early on where I was asked to bug test for Internet Explorer, which at the time was used on a number of our uh, uh, devices in the National Library. And I said, well, does Internet Explorer run on a mobile device? And our developer said, no. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not even going to try and fix the bugs. So we deliberately uh, walked around a browser that a whole bunch of uh, people inside a National Library were using because um, it, the site wasn't being designed for the people in the National Library of New Zealand. Um, so we start with mobile and uh, responsive design. We focus on design elements that function to make the key, uh, but not all el elements of metadata uh, in records visible and accessible. And I've got some example of these as we go forward. So I just want to talk about how we uh, sought to design for these two principles um, and it, of low cost. So focusing on low cost, high bandwidth networks, and also making uh, the site work on mobile devices first. And the first thing we did, uh, as with the co-design group, is we designed for the people of the Pacific, not for the people in the institutions. Um, we wanted, in, even in the visual design, the site to reflect something of the Pacific back to those using the site uh, and to center a very Pacific narrative and experience. Um, so while its default function is to provide search, as you can see there on the screen, 
I said to one of our designers, let's not make this homepage white that they land on, like another search engine that you may know of and probably quite use a lot. Um, so the design that you see here, the birds, the stars, silhouettes of locations, uh, even the color palettes are all designed to enable a person from this island uh, to recognize, uh, and when I say this island, I mean in the generic, <laughs> the Pacific Islands, to recognize, maybe see that shape, that place, that home, uh, to select it and to see the records in some way labeled with that location. So our homepage design was to make it as easy to find records uh, as, as a Pacific person. And we really intentionally focused on the individual locations. Um, often our mental models of the blue continent is it's just ocean. Uh, because that's kind of what it looks like. <laughs> um, but if you're from Chuk, if you're from the Marquesas, the Vanuatu or Numia, these islands, these coastlines are your home and we wanted to allow you to see that. So on the desktop browser, as you hover across those locations, uh, 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 um, a silhouette of, of the island uh, location um, is shown. Um, this, also, this approach also allowed us to speak to Indigenous naming conventions and how a culture or a community might choose to be labelled. Um, so, for example, if you, and this is just a screen grab, but if you're looking on the actual site, um, you won't see French Polynesia listed, um, but you will see uh, the five archipelago that make up um, French Polynesia. Um, and I think that's a, a really powerful way of just trying to, again, recenter this specific narrative for Pacific people. One of our co-designers called for this approach in one of our first workshops, and they said it really simply, and we've, we've sort of always kept it in front of us. I'm Samoan, show me the Samoan stuff, because uh, that's what people want if they're from that, that island in that place. Um, I also want to acknowledge that these locations on the front end are kind of a proxy, um, as we rely on the metadata of content partners that hold these records or the source records. And so there may be records that we're not showing in these location pages, but that are still accessible in the website. So what that means is if you have a record that is uh, in the description is labeled uh, Nui, um, to build the, uh, the location pages here, we're looking in the location field. So um, it may not appear, it'll appear in the main site, but maybe it doesn't appear in the location site. So it's a bit of a, uh, like I said, a proxy. Um, the second thing in terms of designing for Pacific users rather than institutions is that we recognize that uh, multiple locations and have multiple language across the Pacific. And so we had to design an interface that was icon friendly uh, and didn't use a lot of words, particularly English words. Um, one of our user testers said, I like this interface, and this is from the mobile interface. Um, I like it because my grandma can speak English, but she can't read English, so she could figure this out. Um, we also sought to reduce some of the complexity that libraries and institutions often uh, have uh, in their interfaces and their formatting. Um, and so we chose, as you can see on the screen here, just six uh, formats to kind of centralize most of our records around. Um, this was a challenge for some of our librarians in our co-design process who, when I, when I presented this text uh, construct, quickly asked me, Did, does that mean published? Does that mean unpublished? Does that mean letters? Does that mean magazines? And I said, I don't know, anything with words, is that okay? Um, because I think for if you're not a librarian, a text has a, has a different meaning than if you are a librarian. And again, we were designing for non-librarians. Um, we also realized early on that for Pacific people, their culture is lived. It's held in stories and songs and the oral telling of stories and songs and carving and navigation and food preparation. Um, and so we were keen to reflect that reality and we've engaged with a number of content partners, uh, particularly our Pacific based ones who are creating content that is on YouTube or Vimeo and is, is um, using video instead of maybe more written uh, documentations. Now, if you're an archivist, you'll uh, fully appreciate that YouTube is not archival standard, um, but you know, one example of this is that one of our content partners, NGO Pacifica Renaissance, which is an NGO based in Japan, um, has since 2014 recorded the oral stories and histories of Micronesia told by the residents of those islands in their languages whilst they sit on their land. And their only platform that they're able to use uh, can afford is YouTube and Facebook. Uh, and we share in about 800 of their videos. Um, and I guess what I reflect on when we share these and make them accessible is if NGO Pacifica Renaissance had not done this work, had not recorded these stories, many of them would have been lost because a large number of the people in these uh, recordings have since passed on. Um, and if the recordings hadn't been made, their knowledge would have also passed on. So I think that creating a space like this that holds records like those on YouTube, alongside those of maybe more storied institutions, such as the National Library of Australia, enables us to ask this question when we've designed this way. 
Are the institutions holding Pacific artifacts as static frozen things on shelves or in boxes detailed with academic metadata? Are they really preserving them, abstracted as they are from the lived knowledge of their usage? And if we do so, and in that way, who are we preserving and protecting them from? My institution, the National Library of New Zealand, holds the tanoa, the, uh, the bowl, the wooden bowl, uh, for kava of Robert Louis Stevenson. And the first time I saw this, I asked if we could make kava in it. Uh, and there was quite a look of confusion in the, in the curators, because, you know, why would one do that? Um, which I understood. <laughs> um, but also, from a certain perspective, what's the point of just storing on a shelf a bowl that's designed to make and share kava from, uh, if it's never used to make and share kava? <laughs> uh, it's just a piece of wood uh, from that perspective. For a Pacific person, just storing uh, something makes little sense. And the cultural and heritage, heritage value for us is not embedded in, embedded in the, embodied in the object. It's what the object enables. And how do we make that accessible? Um, I think in the same way, uh, what, one of the things we've tried to do is to reduce complexity. Uh, this on the screen here is our search filtering functionality. And it took about a week, a week's worth of development time, but we're quite, and we're quite pleased about how it quickly enables uh, uh, users to focus and filter through many records. We've got about 300,000 uh, at the moment. Um, and the key logic here, uh, if you're using it on the site, is that users should never be able to see zero records. Uh, and as you see or select options, you'll, you'll see uh, the records that match those criteria in real time. I don't, and I appreciate this isn't a new concept. Many sites use the same logic. Um, but again, in terms of usability of sites, it does reduce complexity and increase accessibility. And I'm also pleased in terms of our design, how our approach makes the images or the thumbnails that we show uh, the heroes. Often in our Western literary traditions, we make heroes and highlight the words. Um, and this is an example of how I think the the, the image is highlighted. Um, this is Tui Levuka uh, from Fiji. Uh, and this is the source record held at the National Library of New Zealand. So there's quite a difference between the two. This here is the very academic metadata from a library. And the one before is 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 heroing the, the image of the person who knows it. Um, and, and I think that's quite a powerful difference. We ultimately will always land the user on the source record that you're staring at here, but we want them to have a slightly different experience before they get to the source. Um, I think uh, my fourth reflection is to know what you are what you're not and build relations accordingly. Um, we're not a repository. We don't do any curation of records. We don't we don't hold any source content. Uh, we only use metadata. So we are, in that sense, like Digital NZ uh, here in Aotearoa, like DPLA in the United States, Europeana uh, or Trove in Australia, and we leverage or collect uh, collect the metadata from our content partners. <laughs> In doing so, we rely on the authority and due diligence of the content partner around their metadata and honor that. You know, we always show what they, uh, they have on their source records. Uh, importantly, we never hold any source images. Um, we only ever present as a set of thumbnail image alongside text-based metadata, and we don't embed any digital content such as audio or video. To actually play or listen to that, you have to go to the source, uh, the content partner and their source platform. Um, we aim to work really equitably on behalf of all our content partners. Um, we only share publicly accessible digitized records and we share the respective copyright conditions that are applied uh, from the source on each record. Our harvests of metadata are recurring. And what that means is when metadata on a content partner site is um, refreshed, we reflect those changes when we next, when we next uh, harvest the metadata. Um, uh, fifth reflection here is uh, language and authority matters, uh, and so make them visible and accessible. We don't do any translation for the sake of translation uh, for an English speaking or an English understanding audience. Uh, we only need to match the fields in our schema to ensure that the front end of the website works. And so we welcome metadata in any language. So if it's written in Chamorro or Tokpasin or French or, or any other language, we will highlight it and present it as it's recorded. Um, we always present the metadata as, as it's recorded by the content partner, and this um, obviously allows us to present multiple languages. Uh, in this case here on the screen, um, Dr. Teresi on the left of your screen, who is at the University of Hawaii Hilo, uh, she focuses on highlighting the culture and heritage for Fiji, and the majority of her content, which is on YouTube, is hosted in the Bowen language, which is uh, recorded there. Uh, and on the one on the right, this is a, a historical record of a text from 1896 held at the Australian National University Library. 
Um, I'd also like to, as sort of a, we'd look to wrap up here, is acknowledge the work of local contacts. Some of you may be aware of the work they do, uh, which is Jane Anderson and Maui Hudson and their team. Uh, and they've supported us a lot with this concept and the construct of traditional knowledge, label, knowledge labels and notices. Uh, we have fields in our API for traditional knowledge labels and notices, and we're exploring ways to reflect these uh, fields, um, such as Māori subject headings from institutions such as the National Library of New Zealand. We don't yet have any content partners using these labels or notices, and so they're empty fields are on our API and on the front end. But as and when we harvest these, we want we would look to ensure these labels are best represented rep, best represented on the on the website. I think importantly for me, we never take metadata. In the event we use copies of metadata, so it always was retained by the source. Um, in the event of our site being shuttered, and to Jayseri's point about our funding currently only existing till June 23, uh, it, um, that, that is our reality that, reality that we're working with. But if we are to be shuttered or closed, uh, the content partners will lose nothing because they are always the holders of the metadata and the source content. And I think for me, in a philosophical way, that's really important. Um, because in the terms of a civic wide experience of colonialism and a legacy of taking records uh, for institutions far away from the Pacific, this was a really crucial distinction. Um, digital colonization and the appropriation of culture is already taking place and we couldn't in our design be a space that enabled that. Um, basically, we work with all our content partners to best represent their metadata and make it easy for people to get to their source content. Um, as I wrap up here, um, in a Pacific way, it's the relationships that matter. Um, the Pacific Ocean covers 33% of the surface area of the globe, as I said, uh, and this is the view of it. Um, across this ocean uh, and 22 Pacific Island countries and territories live millions of people whose heritage and culture goes back hundreds and thousands of years. And that heritage is in this moment scattered right across the planet. We've sought to create a space that enables Pacific people to access the content in Taonga whole, held by the global cultural heritage sector, as well as honour the work of that same sector. In doing so, we think we've designed a site that serves as a bridge between the worlds of Pacific people and the worlds of these institutions and the people in them. We seek to highlight Pacific-based institutions, their artefacts and records and stories in the ways that are relevant to their cultures, and to use the digital platforms that they can leverage from their locations in the Pacific. Appreciate this approach can push at Western norms and standards of knowledge and organization, but we also seek to center a lived Pacific experience and authority in a way that empowers these Pacific based institutions and communities to make decisions on their terms. We're hopeful that our site also serves as a mirror for cultural heritage institutions and that their metadata that they record and is often, often sitting in catalogs that are vast is now available for them to view. Uh, through the perspective of Pacific peoples as, uh, who have helped us design it. This mirror construct asks cultural heritage institutions to consider how they might better record and provide access to metadata and to imagine how they come into relationship with not just the artifacts of the Pacific, but the people of the Pacific. Uh, Opeta Alofao, who is formerly the head of the National Archives of Fiji and is a member of our co-design group, uh, spoke of our site and said, it's one thing for Pacific people to know they had their culture taken from them. That is, of course, the legacy of colonialism. It's another thing entirely to not know that the artifacts and records of that, their culture still exist and are in storage far away. Our hope is that our project and the kopapa, which we've woven throughout our work, will enable and enhance the knowledge and mana of Pacific people, wherever they may be. And we would also welcome a conversation with your institutions if you hold digitized and online records of the Pacific. Um, and thank you to each of you for the work you do in this space. Uh, we look forward to shining a light on it uh, for the benefit of all the people of this Solwara. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Tim. <clears throat> I think that was also an inspiring presentation of an inspiring project. Now, we have about 20 minutes left for questions and answers. So, as they say, don't all speak at once. Uh, <laughs> Do we have any questions, uh, Tina and uh, Tina, have you noted any uh, questions coming in? Uh, yes, there are totally um, 10 questions. Four questions have been answered. There are still six questions uh, pending. Okay. Um, I don't see any hands up though. Let's see, there was a question from an anonymous 
attendee. What a shame that the person is anonymous. Uh, I think th the question was, uh, great presentation, as you mentioned, cooperation leads to leadership and do L Lab and Balid offer training on leadership for new professionals? That's obviously a question for Dilara. Do your associations offer training on leadership for new professionals? Could you answer that very quickly? Yeah, sure. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I, I think it's a very good question. I don't know who has uh, sent this uh, question to me. But the thing is that Library uh, Association uh, of Bangladesh, they are trying their level best to providing, uh, you know, training on various content contemporary issues. Yes and try to engage new members so, uh, all the time but i i don't know but, but i'm not sure they, they don't actually have any program or any training program on leadership yet maybe in future we'll uh, try to arrange on leadership program thank you thank you and the second one i see is from agus setiawan uh, asking how to make a consortium with other with other institutions with other organizations and uh, the question refers to the information we saw from Nepal and India. Um, I'm not sure if that's a question or a comment. Maybe um, the questioner should email to Debal and, and Delara and ask them. Maybe Debal and Delara, could you put your email addresses in the chat so that that person could pick them up? Agus Setiawan can pick up your emails and maybe you could uh, have a communication with them offline uh, after the webinar. Is that a fair suggestion? I don't think we have time to um, do any more with that question at the moment, that comment. Uh, and there's another question from Mamun, who is actually a member of our regional committee, asking Debal how, uh, according to interlibrary loan in the consortiums in India, how you control the copyright issues, especially for online articles and books. Debal, can you answer that very quickly? And maybe you can give Mamun a more detailed answer offline afterwards by email. But can you answer that very quickly? Is there a, an easy way to control copyright issues for these consortia? Dibal, are you there? I don't see Dibal on the screen. If he's gone, then we will pass on to the next question. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't see Dibal at all. Okay, um, I will leave our two colleagues, Mamun and Dibal, to resolve that question offline by email because they're both on our committee. Okay, um, the next question was from Ronnie Hello, Roger. Sean. Are you, Hello? Are you hearing me? Uh, yes, can Dibal. you be very quick? Yes, yes. Thank you, Mamun, for your questions. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, uh, we actually, for the online articles, there is the option from the publishers give the right to uh, uh, use for the online uh, use for the educational purpose. So we on that ground, so there is no copyright issues if I just article use for the copyright purpose. Delnet okay. or any institutions, they don't sell the articles to anybody. So, so there is no copyright violation to use. So, because they give the right on when they sell the book journals to the publishers, so you can use for the educational purpose. So, I don't think so. There is a, any copyright okay. problem. Thank you, Debal. Um, we need to go on quickly now to another question by Ronnie Rodin. Um, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing uh, the person's name correctly, but. Um, the question is, I am a lecturer in Library and Information Science at Bengkulu in Indonesia. Uh, 
I want to ask about the grand design of college and academic libraries in the Asia Oceania region. Uh, you know, IFLA has a section on library buildings which deals with design of college and academic libraries. Jayshree, would that would you agree that this question should be addressed maybe to the libraries and uh, buildings and equipment section? That's my feeling anyway. Would you like, uh, Ronnie Rodan, are you, if you're online and if you're following, would you like to email me the uh, question and, and we can, I can pass it to the other IFLA experts on library buildings and equipment. And my email address, I will put in the chat uh, or rather, maybe Tina or, or Tina, could you put that in the chat for for the questioner so that I can go on to the next question? Uh, the next question is from Labiba Zain, who is a member of our committee. Welcome, Labiba. Good to see you here. And you're you're asking uh, a question to Delara. Could you elaborate more about the policy and delivery? policy of interlibrary loans on print, for printed books or printed collections, please. Delara, yeah. can you elaborate more? Um, you don't yeah, sure. have much time. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I will. I'll uh, um, let you know that very shortly. Actually, as I mentioned, it's a pilot project. We're working on it, but still now we actually send the printed books, like the hard copy by post. We're using the postal, you know, the courier service for sending the books from one library to another library. Uh, and uh, the postal post or you know courier service post will be bear by the you know respective organization. So th that is actually included in in our policy uh, till now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions in the Q and A box at the moment. Uh, has anyone else among the panelists got questions for maybe Lindley or, or Tim? Any other questions at the moment? I have some questions that I would like to ask, but I'll, I'm waiting for you on the panel to say what's on the top of your mind at the moment. Uh, um, Noviani has her hand up, yes. Noviani, could you come in with your question, please? Noviani from Indonesia, from the National Library. How do we find Noviani? Where is her? Noviani, can you can you jump into the discussion, please? Tina, can you bring in Noviani somehow? Yes, I have uh, invited, invited him to talk. I'm sorry, I accidentally pressed. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, uh, Noviani, we are, we are waiting for you to speak now. Thank you. I, you're I, muted. I'm not, you're, can you I'm unmute not, your microphone? I think Noviani said it was a mistake. That's what I heard. I didn't hear she that. Made, Sorry. She, she, made a, she made a mistake putting a hand up, so she has doesn't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, um, any others? I noticed that, by the way, by the just beside the point, but Noviani is one of the organizers of the CDNL AO meeting coming up in October in Indonesia. Uh, a question from a Vietnamese colleague. Could you, could you give us your question now, please? Uh, no, the, the, the colleague just said, I just want to say thank you very much for the meeting. And that's very good to have that feedback. Thank you. 
Yes, and Nobiani, apologise for pressing the button accidentally. Well, we all do that sometimes, don't we? Um, any more questions from the panellists, from other participants? Okay, um, I have a question for Tim, actually, uh, about the participation uh, in, in the PVM, the Pacific Virtual Museum. What sort of, Tim, what sort of feedback have you had from major institutions in Britain, America, France, Germany? Uh, what sort of um, willingness to participate have you experienced from these institutions which hold cultural heritage materials from the Pacific? Are they willing participants? Uh, I think there's, um, I mean, in part because of the the, con the contractual nature of the agreement, uh, which we have to call ourselves a museum, uh, Pacific Virtual Museum, even though it's just a website, uh, <laughs> there is some confusion about what it is and is not. So that's why I have to try and articulate that. Um, I, I find it uh, interesting when we reach out to some of the bigger institutions to say we would like to share your metadata that is digitized and publicly available. Um, interestingly, most a, a number of the Western ones, uh, and I more the British ones uh, sort of went why would why would we want why would people use your site they can already come to our site uh, and I think that speaks to a, a default in which our sites matter and our institutions matter which is the point in my in my in my talk um, the, the, the sheer fact is that large numbers of Pacific people don't know uh, they might know the British Library they might know the British Museum but they don't know about the Cleveland Museum of Art uh, which holds several thousand Pacific uh, items um, and they and I think one of the challenges in a digital environment is that if you use Google and you type in Tapa or Masi uh, and you're looking for that uh, you might find something from the British Library if, if they've done their Google SEO stuff well um, but yeah, I think the first results actually an, an Indian motor car company um, <laughs> but um, you're never going to find the Cleveland Museum of Art and I think it's on about page 40 because I went and did this exercise um, and it has beautiful Tapa beautiful photographed and beautifully recorded with metadata but google won't find it for you and no pacific person knows to start their search at the cleveland museum of art because the cleveland museum of arts in cleveland ohio and why would that place have pacific records so i think that's the tension with some of the big institutions is they um they put a lot of money into their sites and so why would you um why would something like our project be of use because of course people know about them as an institution uh I think on the flip side of that, Pacific-based institutions are, 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 are straight away, NGO Pacific Renaissance again said to me, I said, well, what what of your records, you know, can you tell us which records? And he just said, all of it. <laughs> just, you can you can share anything on my YouTube channel. Uh, the Cook Islands Research Center, who just recently joined us, are essentially, they have an Omeka instance where they are basically doing all their cataloging. Um, and instead of building a website for that, uh, those records, they are essentially using our site as a proxy. So we harvest directly from their cataloging software and we build the website. And so their metadata is in there. Um, but when you search Digital Pacific, you are finding uh, that uh, small, very small Cook Islands Research Centre alongside <laughs> the National Library of Australia, alongside uh, Auckland Museum, alongside um, the Denver Museum of Na uh, Science and Nature. And so straight away you shift, you bring equity to it. Because I think the challenge for Pacific-based institutions is if they do digitize, and that's a challenge, if they do have a repository, and that's a costly exercise, if they can afford to build a website uh, and afford the social media, they're just one of thousands, tens of thousands of institutions doing exactly the same thing. And in a world where Google uh, is the only thing that, that essentially flattens your, your, your existence, you don't have a chance. So how does our site start to lift? So I think it's really interesting that the smaller institutions are really keen. Uh, big established institutions probably don't see as value as much because the value is in their stuff. I think we've, we've tried to get a few of them around to say, well, we don't take anything from you. We only point at you. <laughs> uh, and that's been quite an interesting one. Um, there's even a bias in there, and I'll finish with this little anecdote. I can't remember which institution it was, but they said, um, we're happy for you to use our catalog and you can share the content on your site, but you can only share the content that we have on display. So I went to their, their API 
uh, and I looked at it and uh, I, my default Fiji, I type in Fiji and they had, I think about 15,000 Fiji items in their catalog with thumbnails and metadata. And then I checked the box that said, uh, show me the ones on display. And it went from 15,000 to, uh, if I, I'm a former teacher, so if I was in a classroom, I'd say, what do you think? Um, but I'm in a Zoom call, so I won't ask that. Uh, they had three items on display. So in their very definition of what we could show, even though if you could get to their website and knew their website existed, you could find 15,000 records. What they were saying to us is we only want to show you the things that we have on display, of which there's three. And I think that's a really, because <laughs> it doesn't mean the records don't exist in that institution. <laughs> it just means that, again, they're saying you can't, you can only look at the ones we've got out. Um, and that that's the bit that constantly staggers me. I think these institutions, I've spoken with colleagues in Germany, and obviously Germany has a long history with the Pacific. Um, they have warehouses of content uh, that isn't digitized, that is barely cataloged. And I had to sort of do a double take, you know, warehouse plural, you know, um, we're, we're talking, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it is a powerful thing to, to sit here and know that institutions have warehouses of content that Pacific people don't know exists. And I think um, uh, we have to keep pushing and pushing at that. So I don't know if I answered your question, Winston, and have you actually dropped off the call? So I'm just talking to myself at this point. <laughs> uh, um, yes, sorry, get a bit of bit, bit enthusiastic when you ask a question like that. I think there's a wonderful opportunity with our project and um, an opportunity for us to make uh, these records more accessible uh, is, is, a, is a real privilege. Um, and as I said at the end of my uh, presentation, uh, if you are an institute and uh, Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, uh, Central Asia, uh, and interested in, and you know you have Pacific content, we'd love to share and show it. Um, I'm not sure who to hand to now, the Winston's gone. <laughs> Who has the most seniority around the room? Winston, he's gone. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. He's probably, he, I know he's at the National Library, so he's, maybe everything's turned off because it's late at night then. Um, Tina, did we have any more questions? Yes. Um, there, there are two more. There are two more. And uh, one is uh, to ask Ray, about sending staff to each other and how many staff in the library and how many dura durations? Uh, this is from Angus, say Taiwan. Oh. Yes, um, it depends on the, what can I say, the year. And uh, I think it's six or seven people I think, but uh, there are some, uh, what can I say? Some materials in English. So I'll send you as the answer. So would you please uh, read the material? Um, what can I say? I sent the uh, link of the material to the as, as the answer. Can can you see the uh, the answer? I'm not sure. No, I I, I can't see. Would you like to contact contact Angus um afterwards, privately? Yes, I Perhaps you can leave your email address to the chat box. Okay. Okay, thank you. And there's another question from Renata Williams. This is to Jeshui. Jeshui, how are you? Uh, we can't wait to have our resources on Digital Pacific. I'm sorry, Tina, I didn't catch that. And I can see Tim laughing, so I'm not quite sure what that means. Well, yeah, I, I think, think uh, I was, sorry, Tim, Tim, I'm just going to say, 
Yeah, yeah I'm just going to say, Mirinetta, um, whilst you're more than welcome to email um, Jayshree about Digital Pacific, um, she's probably going to send it straight back to me. Um, so I'll just put my email in the chat uh, the chat as well uh, for connecting with the Digital Pacific project. Um, I apologize. I don't know which institution you're from, but yeah, we'd love to start a conversation about how we could uh, share and show your resources. And I guess um, Miranetta, whom I know, Mira, she's at uh, SPREP, uh, South Pacific Regional Environmental Program. And uh, Mira had uh, added a comment earlier about um, um, working with you, negotiating with you in joining um, the program. And because I know Mira um, personally from having worked in libraries, I had sent her what I thought was a private message just saying you know it's good to see you on board and to see that uh, you're going to be joining this program perhaps that's why um, the inquiry was directed to me but yes uh, totally it was intended for you. Yeah no I know uh, sorry and I'm connecting name and institution and yes we're happy we're I think we're in the Marinette might be able to correct me, correct me in an email later but we're waiting for the um the, the higher ups to to authorize and sign the piece of paper and then we will start the work of doing the the digital piece. So there are no more questions. Does anybody have any questions live? I think we can end the session since um, there's no more questions. No, uh, yes. where is Winston? Winston is he, not here. Well, I think his laptop is may have battery flat or something because I we I understand that he has uh using his laptop previous uh for the session. Yes, and I, I I messaged him and and um clearly he's not picked up the message. So um I imagine he's just dropped out. Um well are we agreed as a group that um we've come to the end of the session? Um um, on behalf of Winston and seeing as I wasn't a speaker, I'd like to thank you all very much um, for um, uh, agreeing to, to present again. You know, you presented at uh, uh, WLIC in Dublin um, and uh, agreed to present again to a much uh, uh, bigger audience. Um, we went up to 71 uh, and we still have 64 with us. So thank you all very much. Um, for those of you in the audience, um, if you do think of any questions, any follow-up you'd like to do, um, do email us and we'll be happy to, um, uh, to get back to you. Did anybody else from the committee want to add anything? And the recording of the webinar will be available on EFA website. Thank you, Tina. Yes, the recording will be available. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I hope uh, session went well so there was much problem from my side because um, slide was not moving sorry for that <laughs> uh, ray um did you have any comments uh, no no comment thank you okay <laughs> not putting you on the spot okay well that brings us to the end of this session thank you all for attending and uh, we'll hope to see you at the next one. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.